From the breezy rolling hills of South Central Florida, this is Far Out Radio. I'm Scott Teeters. Today is Wednesday. It is October the 15th, 2014. Hope you had a good day and are ready for some fun Far Out Radio. Al Satterwhite is back with us this evening. Al is a master photographer. He was with us last year to talk about his then new photography art book titled Hunter S. Thompson, The Cozumel Diary. Al's master files of negatives are a virtual treasure trove of our times. He has photographed so many interesting people. Now, since Al's last visit, he's found a bundle of gems that he's making into another special book, a limited edition photography art book. The subject on this one is the one and only, the greatest, Muhammad Ali. Al has a Kickstarter project going to fund the book, and you can see a promo video of the project by going to Google and search for Al Satterwhite Ali. Uh, Satterwhite is spelled S-A-T-T-E-R-W-H-I-T-E, Ali, A-L-I. And the link for the uh, uh, project page should be at the top of the search result. The book's title is Muhammad Ali, The Comeback, and will feature Al's rarely seen photographs of Muhammad Ali in his prime, when he was training at Miami Beach at the famous Fifth Street Gym in the early 70s. Of course, Kickstarter is an online funding system, and if you'd like to help Al out with a project, you can do so on the Kickstarter page. The funding has nine days to go, and there are various special gifts for different levels of contributions. There will be three versions of the book printed. The general edition, expected to retail at $75. The collector edition, expected to retail at $150. And the artist limited edition, expected to retail for $500. There will be first edition books only. 500 of them uh, will be available in the numbered and signed limited editions. And anyone interested should reserve their copy now. So for our younger viewers, you might be wondering, why is Muhammad Ali so important that a limited edition book would be produced? Well, I was only 10 years old in 1964 when a young, brash 1960 Olympic gold medal winner for boxing named Cassius Clay won the World Heavyweight Championship against all odds, defeating Sonny Liston, a frightfully tough boxer with the nickname The Brown Bear. It was stunning. Cassius Clay had electrified professional heavyweight boxing like no one before or since. He was like the Elvis Presley of boxing, a man with genuine charisma. But Cassius had a secret. He was a Muslim. And the day after the Liston fight, he publicly converted to the Nation of Islam and took the name Muhammad Ali. And he explained his new, way, his new name thusly. Muhammad means worthy of praise and Ali means most high. Definitely a name worthy of him. Three years later, when he was drafted and declared himself a conscientious objector, Ali stated, quote, War is against the teachings of the Holy Quran. I'm not trying to dodge the draft. We're not supposed to take part in no wars unless declared by Allah or the messenger. We don't take part in Christian wars or wars of any unbelievers, unquote. And more succinctly and infamously, he said, quote, I ain't got no, no quarrel with them Viet Cong. No Viet Cong ever called me nigger, unquote. That's what the man said. Upon his induction, he refused to step forward when his name was called, which was a felony crime. He was arrested, and the next day he was stripped of his title and his license to fight. Two months later, after the trial, after only 21 minutes of deliberation, he was found guilty. The Court of Appeals upheld the case, and it went to the Supreme Court, where it was finally overturned on June the 28th, 1971, by a unanimous 8-1 to decision. I'd call that a knockout. Now, George Carlin amusing, had an amusing rap on Muhammad Ali's situation. After Ali won his court case, George said, He's allowed back to work again. He wasn't for a while, as you know, about three and a half years they would let him work. Of course, he had an unusual job, beating people up. It's a strange calling, I know, but it's one you're entitled to. Government didn't see it that way. Government wanted him to change jobs. Government wanted him to kill people. And he said, no, that's where I draw the line. I'll beat him up, but I don't want to kill him. And the government said, well, if you won't kill him, we won't let you beat him up. Ha, ha, ha. That's that wonderful George for you. So Muhammad Ali made his comeback, and it was a big deal. And Al Satterwhite was privileged to be able to capture images of this amazing man and spend some time with him. Hi, Al. Welcome back to the program. 
Hey, thanks for having me. How you doing? Uh, it's gone good. It's gone good. Pardon for the long intro, but considering the subject, and since Muhammad Ali is now 72 years old, living a very quiet life and uh, dealing with his Parkinson's illness, uh, he's kind of faded out of the public awareness. But wow, man, back in the 60s and the 70s, he made the nation pay attention to heavyweight boxing like no one before or since. So tell us, how was it that you were able to have photographic access to Muhammad Ali and uh, at this important uh, time in his life? Well, in those days, I, I was a magazine photographer. I was living in Florida in, in Palm Beach at the time, which is like an hour north of Miami. So um, several magazines like Time and Life and uh, some of the overseas magazines assigned me to cover him after he he won his decision against the draft, and he was able to fight again. So he started working out in Miami at the Fifth Street Gym, which was, you know, a classic place. I, I Maybe not classic is the word, but, you know, kind of like a mecca for boxing then. It no longer exists. It was torn yeah, down about torn down. five or six years ago, I think, or maybe even longer. But it was a gym upstairs in Miami Beach and, you know, typical, you know, kind of smelled of damp socks. And there was a big ring set up in the middle and big open windows. And uh, I think there were some bleachers somewhere set in there. Maybe not. Most of the people stood. But... You could come upstairs, and they may have charged you like a buck or something, but, you know, people would come upstairs and stand around and watch, and, you know, he would spar, work out, and, of course, the press was always there. So there were a lot of writers, and there would maybe be me and one or two other photographers. Since I was there for, you know, days on end, you know, they'd kind of come and go, or I might even be there by myself. And um, we had full reign of the place. I mean... They didn't have handlers in those days. There was this trainer, Angie, Angelo, and, you know, we, I introduced myself to him and Ali, and it was kind of like, yeah, kid, go at it, you know, and th they didn't pay me any more mind. Plus, Ali and I were friendly. We were close in age, so um, I would walk around with him when he walked to lunch, and he'd stop and talk to kids. He, he was great with kids. He'd spend like 15 minutes talking to them, sitting on a on a step somewhere. And it was a neighborhood area once you got off the main drag. Or we'd go riding around the limo or, you know, different things like that. Um, so it was, I had a real personal inside look with him. And he was, you know, he, he just acted like a normal guy. I mean, he was just Ali. And uh, so it was easy to deal with him and it was easy to photograph him. You just had to... You know, pick your moments and watch and wait for what you thought was a good picture. You mean this Basically, place? Basically, I actually... shot about, uh, uh, I think uh, I shot about 55 rolls uh, of film. Uh, wow. So I have a lot uh, to choose from. I'm sorry to uh, mean to interrupt. Oh, quite all right. Uh, that's a lot of rolls of film back then. I was just saying to my wife the other day, it's funny how digital photography has changed everything. Uh, you know, with memory sticks that can hold thousands of images, you just shoot and shoot and shoot and don't really think about it. But back when you had to buy all those rolls of film and carry them around, you know, if you had a roll of 36 in your camera, you felt like you were loaded for bear. Uh, <laughs> well, not uh, only that, but uh, in any event, particularly sports, you when you started getting around frame number 25, you started thinking about what was coming up because, like, if we'd shoot football or something where the action was constant, it, a lot of times, if there'd be a uh, like an end of a play, or you had it, you know, you're going to have like 30 seconds. We would dump the roll of film and load a fresh one immediately, because you didn't want to be on the last three frames and all of a sudden something really important happened. Yeah, you also had to be a little more careful in you know what you were shooting. Mm -hmm. I think the, one of the problems today is because there's no restrictions like that. People just motor drive everything, which is not a great way to shoot anyway, and then they never edit it. Right. I mean, I, I read about guys like, they go on a trip and shoot 25,000 pictures. Wow. Hell, I didn't shoot 25,000 pictures in a whole year. <laughs> you know, so I don't understand it. Yeah. And I, I shoot digital, time. but, you know, I still shoot selective and, you know, I still edit everything and throw out all the crap because even though hard drives are relatively cheap, they're still expensive. Mm -hmm. I find it just to be amazing that uh, the, that the gym was open to the public. Just anybody could come in? Oh, yeah. 
You know, yeah. it was wasn't a big deal. I mean, usually there wouldn't be more than on a really big day. There might be like maybe twenty eight people there. Wow. Um, you know, there weren't that many boxing fans just who lived in the area who had access to it. But, you know, the people that were there were definitely Ali fans because I have pictures of him, and I remember after a workout he'd be leaning up against the ropes looking out at the audience and talking to them and taking questions and just, you know, going back and forth with them. I mean, he was such a lively character, and he had such great quotable lines. And he just loved to tweak the uh, the sports writers because they were always into, like, Ali, what's your secret? And, in <laughs> fact, again, showing you how kind of smart, street smart he is, I have a picture of him. It's, it's on the uh, Kickstarter website. He, he took an envelope from a hotel, and he wrote the secret of Muhammad Ali on it, and then he held it up in front of, the, uh, in front of him out to the, to the press, and it's basically, here's my secret. <laughs> yeah, he was notorious for taunting uh, not only just the press but also his opponents. And I was reading about him uh, in his uh, Ali Frazier fight this afternoon. He would say stuff like, uh, "Frazier is too ugly to be the champ. <laughs> Frazier is too dumb to be the champ." Uh, he was in the ring with him, and and, and Joe Frazier was just a he was just a, a a mountain of a guy, and he's just thundering away at Ali while Ali's on the ropes, letting the ropes take all the all the energy. And he'd be saying, is that all you got? <laughs> well, yeah, I think there was another story. I mean, I never covered any fights, so I'm not real sure. But uh, I think one of the fighters wouldn't call him Muhammad Ali. He, he refused to call him Cassius. And so when Ali got him in the, in the ring, he just pound away at him. And he'd say, what's my name? What's my name? What's my name? And hit him again. <laughs> I think, you know, it might be from a movie I saw. <laughs> but Ali had lots of those moments, and he, he he would always come up with these little limericks, you know, that would, they were great quotes. I mean, he was just great for copy and probably did a lot for the sport because you either loved him or you hated him. There weren't too many in the middle. And I was never really a boxing fan. I mean, I I don't think I'd ever or have ever shot a boxing match but it's fun being around people i mean i really like people and he was definitely a an interesting guy to be around and you know fun and great to photograph and, and really a big pussy cat i mean he was huge he was six i think six four and i'm like five eleven but he towered over me and he was he was just a big guy but he he never seemed like intimidating, threatening in any kind of a way, mm -hmm. you know, which is why I call him like a big pussy cat because he didn't put that out there, you know. He only did it in a ring or maybe against his opponent, but he was really a sweet guy. <laughs> Strange for a boxer. Well, when I was reading about his um, uh, the Liston fight, of course. Uh, uh, I was surprised, I was not totally surprised, that one of his role models for self-promotion was a, a professional wrestler named uh, Gorgeous George Wagner. And Gorgeous George was notorious for coming into the into the uh, into the ring wearing a cape, and he had pretty girls on his arms, and he, his hair was blonde, bleach blonde, and all wavy. And you know, he, he was a pretty good-looking fellow, but he he really yucked it up for this uh, uh, for his big entrance. Uh, but he, he uh, this was apparently Ali's uh, role model, and uh, before the uh, uh, Liston fight, he was uh, he was quite he was running that running that routine on uh, on uh, Sonny Liston, and then the day after the fight, they said that he was uncharacter uncharacteristically calm and humble, which kind of took the uh, uh, the news reporters back because they were expecting. You know the brash uh, Cassius Clay, and then he of course came out with this announcement that he, uh, you know, was indeed converting to the Nation of Islam. He'd been flirting with uh, uh, the faith for quite a few years, but kept it a secret because he didn't. He felt that if it had come out, it might affect his chances for a, uh, a title shot. And it probably would have. Yeah, there wasn't that much known about it then. You know, it's kind of kind of a good thing to stay away from religion when you're in certain areas, anyway. Yeah. There was an interesting quote that was heard from someone at the press conference that said, 
they, they overheard somebody say, yeah, he's a card-carrying Muslim. And, of course, this was at a time, this was, you know, 1964, when the, just the term card-carrying usually meant fill-in-the-blank communist. So, you know, when somebody said, oh, he's a card-carrying whatever you fill-in-the-blank, it's not a compliment. Yeah, I don't think anybody back then really, or most people didn't really know what being a Muslim was all about. It was just that other religion that we don't know yeah. about. But being a card carrier certainly wasn't very good. Yeah, well, you know, they, like I said, people either hated him or loved him. And that was the interesting thing about this and, and the pictures in the book, because since they aren't, I, since I didn't do a fight, since they're not fight coverage, they're, they're only when he's, he's relaxed or when he's, you know, a different mindset and uh and they're just a totally different look at him and and what he is and they're also at when he was really at his height of i'd say power and good lookingness and all that other stuff because he was about what back then about 30 yeah 30 plus or minus two years i'm not good at mathematics right now but he was, was he was a real good looking guy in really good shape and and you know the pictures show that you know, and and they show the people around him too. You know, his trainer and, and some of his other trainers, and Angie and Chris, the guy who, who was Angie's brother, who actually promoted the fights and owned the uh, Fifth Street Gym. Uh, what year was this, Al? This would have been uh, 1970. I, I covered him in 1970 and 1971. Okay, because he was born in uh, he was born in 42. Uh, so he'd have been, uh, you know, 28, 30, somewhere around there. Yeah, that's about right. Right. So, you know, when you're that age, you're um, you're feeling pretty good, and it's a long road ahead. Things I read the, some interesting comments from other boxers who had been in the ring with him, and they said that, uh, you know, and it's... It's one of those things that you don't really think much about, but if you go back and you look at old... Um, uh, video of boxers from the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, these guys would pretty much stand there and just slug it out. You know, hey, slugger, that kind of stuff. But Ali was the, you know, the float like a butterfly, sting like a bee guy. He, and one of, I forget which one of his opponents said that he was never still and he was just the hardest top, uh, hardest target to hit. Yeah, he was, he really practiced his footwork and he was really agile. Now, last night when we watched this uh, uh, wonderful program for our Netflix listeners, if you're Netflix subscribers, I mean, um, there's a, a program, it was a PBS special uh, titled 1964, and it's all about the year 1964, you know, the year after the Kennedy assassination. And it, in this uh, context, they really show you what a, what a truly pivotal year it was for the nation. Starts off uh, a very happy, uh, almost nostalgic kind of a presentation. Um, about a time when America was really uh, happiest with itself. Uh, and then Beatles arrived, and it was just like the perfect salve after uh, um, uh, the Kennedy assassination. And then they got right into the Ali Frazier fight. And you get to see young 22-year-old uh, Cassius Clay uh, at that time uh, in the ring doing his thing, and uh, you, you get a little bit of a whiff of the, the, uh, the genuine uh, charisma uh, that this fellow had, even at the age of 22. Yeah, he was, um, as I recall, he was also in the Olympics before that. Yes, he won a gold medal in the 1960 Olympics. Yeah, not many people even remember that. But it was, it was an interesting era, not necessarily a good era, depending on which side of the fence you're on. But uh, we were talking earlier, and you mentioned, or I mentioned a story to you about a friend of mine, Flip Schulke, who was uh, another photographer in Florida at the time, who started covering Ali when he was Cassius Clay in the 60s. And um, they got to be really good friends, and he even took him shopping at one of the local department stores and, you know, became incensed because since Ali was black, they wouldn't let him try on any clothes. Uh, you know, and you don't really realize that if you're white because you never run into that problem. But, but Flip was a uh, Flip was a, a cool photographer, and he was into skin diving. He shot a lot of underwater work, and he also worked for Life Magazine a lot. So, he had a Life Magazine assignment to shoot Ali, and he got to talking to him, and 
And as soon as he had, he probably mentioned that he was a, a underwater photographer. Ali, matter of factly, just tossed out this little gem of, "Oh yeah, I, I, uh, I work out underwater. It's, it's really good for your muscles." And of course, Flip went, "Wow, that's great!" So he called uh, Life Magazine on the phone in New York, and he got another day assignment out of it. Came back the next day with his aqualung stuff to a swimming pool, and and they shot Ali, and it's a it's a well known famous picture that you can buy, photograph now. It's not cheap. Uh, Flip died a few years ago, but. It shows Ali underwater in a swimming pool with boxing trunks on, boxing, which is really cool. So about six months or a little longer after that, Ali was talking to Angie, his manager, and he brought that up. And Angie laughed, and he said, Ali doesn't even swim. He certainly doesn't practice underwater. You've been had. And it just showed you how whip-smart, street-smart Ali was when he saw something that would would get him some interesting publicity you know he just put it out there and he, was, he, was, he, he certainly was, was a like trickster that. he was a trickster that's for sure definitely was float like a butterfly sting like a bee there ain't nobody like muhammad ali <laughs> true and it's really true yeah i mean he called himself the greatest and uh uh it's kind of hard to argue with that uh I was telling you earlier that when I looked at, uh, I hadn't looked at pictures of him in quite some time. And uh, one of the things that struck me was that even though knowing that he was a very big guy, six, uh, three or four, whatever it was, when you just see pictures of him, like the shots you have uh, on your pages there, and there he is in his trunks, looking absolutely magnificent, he's so proportioned that he doesn't look that big until you see him next to, you know, a normal person. Yeah. And then you realize that, yeah, that, this is a big dude. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty much it. Need scale next, Ali. Indeed. We have our music playing now, so we're going to take our break. If you're just joining us, Al Satterwhite is with us. We're talking about uh, a new art book project that he has going. It's for a, a new Muhammad Ali book. It's called Muhammad Ali, The Comeback. And he's got a, a Kickstarter um, a project going for it. And if you uh, would like to have a look-see at the page, just do a Google search for Al Satterwhite Ali, and it will be at the top of the search page. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to Far Out Radio. Just, just joining us, uh, our guest this evening is Al Satterwhite. He's a photographer, master photographer, and you can follow his work at his website, alsatterwhite.com. And actually, you can spend a lot of time on his website because he's got a lot of pictures there, uh, you know, outlines of his books with sample photographs, and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, Al. Great stuff. It really is. And he's got a new book out titled Muhammad Ali, The Comeback. So uh, tell us about the book, Al. Um, how did it come about, um, and where are you with it? Well, it's on Kickstarter, uh, so I can fund it because um, I, I have the book printed in China at a really good uh, printing company. It's all offset uh, or web or whatever. The, you know, I'm not a printer, but the, I, the Hunter Thompson book, and I'm doing it the Ollie book the same way, was um, Duotone, black and white, and it's one of the best ways to reproduce black and white images on a printed page. So we do pre-press testing to get it exactly where I want it because I want black and white. I don't want brown and white or blue and white or blue and black, brown and black. So it's good printing. Um, the print runs I usually do are about a 1,000, which is your minimum run. And then I usually do something like in this case where I have 500 numbered and signed copies and 200 of those will be in clamshells, and they're $500 because they'll come with two archival prints, 8 by 10s And then the other uh, 400 or 300, actually, will be in slipcases. And they're numbered and signed also, which makes them collectible. I mean, some people who can't afford to collect photography prints because the print will start at $1,000 or more, where you could buy a book or even like the clamshell with two small prints for $500, you can get into collecting a lot easier. And most of the time, I mean, there's no guarantee, but most of the time on any book like this that's quality printed, really low print run, limited edition, they go up over time. I mean, if you start looking around at some books printed in the 80s or in the 70s that were 
limited edition and probably even bigger ones than a thousand. Some of those books, if you can even find them, are five or six hundred dollars, and they originally sold for maybe sixty-five. Hmm. So it's it's an interesting way to collect. Um, the Kickstarter thing is an interesting way to fund, and I'm up to um, almost or a little over three quarters or a little more than that of the money I need. And you can find it by Googling Kickstarter slash Ali or Kickstarter Al Satterwhite or Kickstarter Muhammad Ali, and, and it'll, it'll pop up. And there, there's a little video I did um, really quick sort of explaining it, and I also wrote it out so you can see it in print. And then there's the way with Kickstarter, the best thing is you have different levels to pledge at. So I think you can buy a, a regular book for, I forget, uh, I think $65. And then it goes up from there. Uh, you can, I have some different arrangements where you could buy a, a clamshell or a uh, slipcase, and for a certain amount of money, you could also get a larger print. And it's a pretty good deal for a print because where I might sell a print for twenty five hundred dollars, if you if you get it here, you may end up getting it for like fifteen hundred dollars less. And all my prints are edition, so they're very small runs, usually twenty five per size. But um, I have a good designer, same one who did my Hunter Thompson book, and a good editor who used to work for Tashin and now works for himself. And um, we're going to get some writers involved. I, I can't promise anything yet, except I talked to Miriam Ali, one of his daughters, and she uh, was more than happy to write the afterword for the book, which basic because she wasn't born when I shot the picture. But I think she can comfortably write whatever she wants about what happened to Ali afterwards, you know, up to, up to the present, to sort mm -hmm. of tie it all together. So it should be a good book. It's going to be about 100 pages. Um, probably it'll have, um, we haven't done a real edit yet, but uh, it'll probably have somewhere around 48 to maybe 70 photographs in it, depending. And I, because I had shot so much film on him, I, I did an edit uh, last year and did a lot of scans and had the dust and scratch removal done on the black and white negatives once I scanned them, and, and then I digitally processed them. So I have like 600 images to pick from that I had narrowed it down to, and out of that 600 will you know, probably come up with the 48 or 70 images. And it's a whole range. You know, Ollie relaxing, Ollie working out, Ollie in, in the limo with kids, with his trainer. It's a good variety of stuff, and it's, you know, it's a look at Ollie sort of behind the scenes because there are no... Fight pictures, right? So it's Ali being Ali, which is pretty cool. Well, you've got him in the gym. He's. Uh, I'm looking at. I'm on your website uh, right now, and for our listeners, if you go to alsatterwhite.com, on the left hand side under the books section, right up there at the top, you click on the Muhammad Ali link. Uh, there's a, a small image there of what the book will look like in the uh, uh, clam case. Uh, I guess that's uh, one of the 8x10 prints there on the left side, Al? Yeah, that's it. Okay. That's, that's what they would look like. But there's a, but there's a nice little selection there of, uh, of uh, Muhammad Ali uh, in the gym, you know, in his, in his gym trunks, uh, um, you know, bare-chested. Another shot here with him uh, working out on the speed bag. And all you can say is uh, what a magnificent-looking human being. I love the shot where it's on the on the lower right side of the page there, where he's got his headgear on. He's just just peeking over the uh, uh, the ropes there. It's an, it's it's one of those neat shots. Thanks. And you can see even more photos and larger um, on the Kickstarter page. Uh, I put a lot of a lot of these up there. When you wander around and, and you're you're you have free access like that. Um, I know how I do it when I'm taking photographs of things, but how do you explain how you manage to capture those kinds of things? What what goes on in your photographer's artist mind's eye when you're looking for compositions? I'm looking at this picture here of, of him with the headset on, uh, headgear on, and he's and you, it's just the eyes and just part of his nose are over the top of the the rope, and it's just it's just one of those moments. It's great. Well, how do you capture that kind of stuff? Well, it, it's like you really want to be a fly on the wall. 
So, I mean, the first thing I do when I get there is introduce myself, tell them what I'm, what I'm going to do, what I'm there for, and usually how long I'll be around. And then I just sort of disappear, you know, and I might stand around and watch them. And I, got, I've had, I used to, in those days, I usually work with three or four camera bodies. And I might just have them hanging on my shoulders and not really pick them up, and I'll just watch them until at some point you, you blend into the wall and the scenery and they no longer pay any attention to you. Mm-hmm. And then when you start taking pictures, they still don't pay any attention to you. And you just have to wait and watch. It's all about waiting for that moment. Right. Did you have, you mentioned you had uh, two or three cameras with you. Did you have like a, a long lens and a normal lens and then a wide angle lens? Well, yeah, I usually work with a couple of wide angles. You know, you might have something like a 20, 21, and then my prime wide angle that I love is the 35 millimeter. And above that, I usually have like an 85, which is like a medium telephoto, and then a 180, which would be sort of longish and still fast, like a 2.8. So even with black and white, you know, you're going to need some speed. And most of the time on, on these, I'm shooting wide open uh, because I want, I want a shallow depth of field. I want hey. the viewer's eye to go where I focus the camera. I know just what you mean. we got our music playing, Al, so we'll take our break. And uh, for our listeners, we'll be back in just a few minutes with more conversation with Al Satterwhite. We're talking about Muhammad Ali. Welcome back to Far Out Radio. Al Satterwhite is with us this evening. We're talking about his new photography art book, Al Muhammad Ali, The Comeback. Al, how long did you say that you were there in Miami uh, photographing Muhammad Ali? Well, it was over a two-year period, uh, usually when he was preparing for first his fight in Atlanta after he came out of his imposed um, vacation, non-fighting while he was waiting for the Supreme Court case. And then the next fight was in 71 was for uh, New York. Um, So I spent uh, a week with him the first time and then went back a few days. And then uh, I spent over a week with him the next time and went back a few days. So I went down, and um, I usually drive down to Miami every day. Uh, mm-hmm. Got down there really early one morning because he, he would run around uh, around the city of Miami Beach and around the golf course uh, like, oh, dark 30. So uh, it kinda, especially in those days, it was really hard to shoot with no light, but I actually have a couple of pictures of him running in the dark. I was just curious after after the time you spent with him there in Miami, did you were you able to keep up with him? Um, what do you mean by keep up with him? I don't know, keep in touch. Did oh, you um, like yeah. Well, usually I don't because you know I was a photographer. I was always working. I was always gone and off, and keeping in touch in those days wasn't like in these days. You had to you had to write a letter or you had to call somebody on a telephone. Um, So I didn't really stay in touch that way, but I moved out to L.A. a couple of years later in 1974, and they had a they had an Ali benefit track meet. I forget the exact name of it, but it was you know for a good cause, and Ali was sponsoring it. So I had an assignment to go cover it, and I remember talking to Ali, and and he remembered me, and uh, I photographed at that event. of him with his current wife then and and some of the uh, personalities that were at the track meet. And that's about as far as it went because after that I don't think I really stayed in touch because he was off fighting mm-hmm. and I was in California. So uh, nobody was really going to fly me to Miami to, to cover him working out again. Mm-hmm. And in those days it was all about expenses and traveling and I mean, we were constantly busy. It was a really a great time to be a magazine photographer. When you went to see him there uh, training in Miami, of course, he was, um, this was just after uh, he, he had won the court case with the Supreme Court. Don't get any better than that, folks. Uh, did he talk any, at all about that, or was he primarily focused on the upcoming fight? No, he was pretty much on the fight. I mean, that's where he was wired. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the sports writers were always around him asking him questions. And uh, if he was off by himself, like uh, we were in the limousine one day, I, I don't know where we were going, but I was usually hunkered down opposite him, probably sitting on the floor. And, you know, he just fell asleep. I have a picture of him with his head kind of leaned up against the window, and he's snoozing away. 
or he was clowning around with uh, one of his other trainers, and uh, that was Ali. You know, he was he was either playing around, having some fun, or he was in between moments and trying to relax. And and again, me being there, it was um, sort of being the fly on the wall. I remember one time we were in the limo, and and I, he may have been looking for something to buy because I remember. He saw a for sale sign in Miami Beach, and we pulled over, and he said, why don't you run up there and ask them what they want? And I said, so, why me? Because, you know, I'm sitting there in a car with three or four cameras on my neck, and he says, because you're the only white guy in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so I got out of the car, took my cameras off, went up, knocked on the door, and I, you know, asked the person, you know, what, what are you asking? And he or she, I forget who it was, they're looking around me at this limousine trying to figure out who's in the car. And they said, well, you know, who wants to know? I said, well, i an interested party in the car. So they gave me a price, and I went back and told them, and we, we went on our way. But, you know, that was that's, kind of a fun moment. That's <laughs> funny, because you're the <laughs> only white you guy. down to car. earth on uh, what's going on in the world. You have. I'm looking at your book section on your website. You have another book that uh, had Muhammad Ali, and it was called Titans, Muhammad Ali, Schwarzenegger. When yeah, did you I did that book, um, uh, I think back in 08, and um, it's a real big coffee table book. And I had spent a lot of time with Arnold once I moved out to California, and it was before he'd actually got into the movies. And, and again, he was a really interesting person to be around, but... I had this great idea of doing a book called Titans, and in my thinking, these are the only two guys worthy of that title because you could probably go anywhere in the world and mention their names and people know who they are. Sure. Or I think a lot of other people, whether they're boxers or bodybuilders, yeah, you know, maybe a few people know them, but not everybody. Right. So I came up with this great concept, sold it, the idea to this uh, publisher, Dalton Watson, or Watson Dalton. Dalton Watts, I guess. And we did this book, and unfortunately, Dalton Watson is really a motorsports publisher. I guess at the time he wanted to sort of break out of that, but he he didn't do any marketing or any PR. He only has it listed on his website, and it sold enough books for me to buy dinner twice a year. <laughs> oh, no. In other words, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it didn't work so well. And, and a lot of people, you know, the Ali fans would look at it and go, what do I want a book with a bodybuilder in it for? And the bodybuilder guys were the same. They'd look at it and go, what's with a boxer? <laughs> you know, because they just don't cross the line. So I should have had two books, you know, stapled together or something so you could tear them apart and take the one you wanted. You've got a photo of Muhammad Ali in there. It's one of one of my favorites. It's he's looking rather pensive, and he's got a, a black zip up, uh, I guess, a sweatshirt or something on. It's a great shot. I love it. Yeah, that's him in the limo. Him in the limo. Yeah, and, and you get great light in something like that, even though it's not really bright. You got light coming in from windows on both sides, so it's it's kind of soft. And I mean, I always look for lighting. I mean, that's the key to everything is lighting, and especially. I hated then and I hate now using strobes. Uh, if we did, you know, we'd try to bounce them off of something so the light would be sure. soft. But, you know, I spent 12 years in New York as an advertising photographer. And, I mean, sometimes we would, I would travel with 24 or 30 huge AC strobes that we'd have to set up and plug in. And I'm kind of like, I never want to see them ever again. I, I just like to move fast and quick and quiet, and that's you, what really gets your picture. You mentioned the uh, the publisher of that Titans book was primarily interested in doing uh, automobiles. Was that the same publisher that did the Carroll Shelby and the Racers book? No, I self-published that. Um, I couldn't find a publisher that would give me any kind of a reasonable deal. Um, it sort of turned into, one, they don't want to publish books anymore, or I don't know what they're picking for subject matter, because they're certainly publishing books. But even if they do, then they want to give you something like 80 cents a copy on everyone sold. So unless you're selling, like, Ansel Adams, you're not making any money. Mm -hmm. And um, I got into this self-publishing thing, and 
you know, now I know what it costs to print a book and how to do it, and basically I have, I'm a publisher. I mean, I have a company now called Red Cat Edition, which is my publisher, uh, me. But I'm the guy who's responsible. I have to hire everybody, pay everybody, oversee everything, make sure, it, you know, the books show up and get delivered. So it's, uh, you know, if you don't want to do that, you're in the wrong business. But if you want to publish a book nowadays, that's kind of what you have to do. Yeah. Um, and you've got to figure out how to market them because distribution is the big problem, just like if you shoot independent movies. If you don't have a distribution channel, a way to get them out there, nobody's going to see your movie mm-hmm. and yep. nobody's going to see your book. And the Racers and the Carol Shelby book are very limited edition. I did a um, hundred of the Racers. And then I, and they cost me, because of the printing process, they were done here in the States, they cost me $97 a book to print. Wow. Which ain't cheap. And they're all numbered and signed. And, and then I found this really cool metal box that's perfect. The book fits in it perfectly. And, and then, of course, I said, hey, can you, can you print on this? And they said, sure, anything you want. So... I had them print a special cover with a photograph and the title on it. So that box cost me another $97. <laughs> so I now have $200 invested in this book, so I sell it for $750, you know, which is a really high price for a book. But one, it's a real limited edition. Two, I've sold uh, about 25 to date. Um, car lovers love the racer book. Jerry mm-hmm. Seinfeld bought one. And, I mean, it covers that era back in the 60s, 10 years, 62 to about 72, where racing went through a big change from no safety, no sponsors, no aerodynamics, no, 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 to vast improvements. And um, it's shown up in this, it's shown in this book because you end up with, you know, the ultimate race car, which was a Porsche 917, which was capable Mm -hmm. of 225-mile miles an hour in the back straight of Le Mans. Right. And they couldn't keep the thing in the ground. It kept trying to take off. It scared the hell out of the drivers. They, they, they tend to do that at that speed. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, Al, when you were uh, covering all the Southern California sports car racing at the time in Carroll Shelby, did you get to know uh, Dave McDonald? Um, Dave McDonald? No, no, no. I, I, no. I photographed him, but I never really... Okay, because he was just this uh, past August inducted into the National Corvette Museum's Hall of Fame. And he eventually worked for Carroll Shelby as a driver. Yeah, he was killed at Indianapolis 500. Indy 64, uh, yep, yep. 50 years ago last night. He he drove a car and people told him not to, but... Yeah, great was driver, Mickey, and he that did, was Mickey Thompson's car. Didn't work. They did a full investigation. They found no driver error. It was the car. It was the so car. anyway, everybody should go to Kickstarter slash Ali and see if you like the book and donate some money. I got nine days to go. All right, good. I hope we hope we uh, help you get some more uh, funding there for your uh, for your uh, book project. Al, uh, Al, we'll do it again sometime. When you get your next project, let me know. I will do that. Thank you much. Thanks a lot. Always great to talk to you. All right, take care. Take care. That is our program for this evening, Friday night on Far Out Radio. Our pal Robert Morningstar will be back with us. We'll be talking about high strangeness, as we always do when Robert's with us. Thanks a lot. Take care of you well. We'll be back Friday. Talk then.